Hey guys, I'm Tony and this is Thrift Theater and this week we're going to take a look at one of my favorite movies of all time, The Burbs. The Burbs is a 1989 horror comedy from Joe Dante who's perhaps best known for Gremlins and The Howling and in the 80s there was a string of horror comedies that was like a thing for a while. You'd get vampire comedies, you'd get zombie, uh, but most of them seem like they were vampire comedies. So The Burbs is ostensibly about a group of suburbanites who become incredibly suspicious of their new neighbors because they're a little bit different than they are, but in the end their worst fears may just come true. But after careful study, I've realized that that's not what this movie is about. So what's it about? It's about how Ricky Butler threw the greatest party of all time and got his neighbors to kill each other. The film follows Ray Peterson, a suburbanite who's on vacation because he's exhausted from his job. His wife Carol wants to go to the lake and relax on a real vacation. But now Ray chooses to stay home and relax. Unfortunately, no peace will be had. His new neighbors, the Klopex, they're really strange. Their home is in disrepair. The lawn's all dried up and dead. And this is like a picture-perfect Leave it to Beaver neighborhood, so no one really thinks that's cool. And also, no one in the entire neighborhood has even seen these people yet. But there are lots of rumors about them. So Ray, along with his neighbors Art and Lieutenant Rumsfeld, become so obsessive and paranoid that they gotta find out what's going on. Because let's face it. Come on, let's face it. You know, these Klopex are strange. I've been watching that house ever since they moved in. No one goes in, no one comes out, no visitors, no deliveries. What do you think they're eating over there, Ray? So the three of them let their imaginations run away and they convince themselves that the Klopex are devil worshippers who are sacrificing people to Beelzebub, namely Walter, an old man who lives at the end of the cul-de-sac. So throughout the film they harass and stalk the Klopex and they certainly see strange things that may justify their suspicions. So they finally decide to take action. The next day when the Klopex leave, they break into their house. <laughs> They dig up their backyard, like the entire yard, they totally destroy the basement, and they ultimately blow the house up after piercing a gas line while digging a six foot deep hole in the basement. Ray is in the basement when the house blows up, but he miraculously survives, having never found any dead bodies in the house before the explosion. But then it turns out that they were right all along. The Klopex were psychopaths. The Klopex try to murder Ray, but he prevails against them ultimately and justice is served. And they're heroes who have protected the neighborhood. Heroic suburbanites. Now that's just like a basic synopsis of the movie that I wanted to run through before we get into it. But like I said, the movie's not really about that. It's about Ricky Butler and how he threw the greatest party of all fucking time. Now I didn't mention him in the synopsis, but Ricky Butler, played by Corey Feldman of course, he spends his days painting his house while his parents are out of town until Thursday, and he watches his neighbors as they completely lose their minds and destroy the neighborhood. And one could argue that he's pretty much behind all of this. So early on in the movie, one of the first things that gets all of this going is when Ray Peterson, who is played by Tom Hanks, his son comes in and is talking about him and he talks about how Ricky Butler said, They only come out at night. Ricky Butler says that they're nocturnal feeders. Oh, Ricky Butler says. And this is one of the things that really sort of gets the whole thing going. So early on, Ricky Butler is manipulating the situation, molding it like clay. So finally we meet Ricky Butler. He comes outside, painting his house. He just spills fucking paint all over his porch and these giant speakers because he don't give a fuck. He's Ricky Butler. And he's basically like the general of the neighborhood. 
He cranks his music and he starts the day for everyone. He lets them know what time it is. Time to get the fuck up. <laughs> Also, one of the things you're going to notice about the cul-de-sac where everyone lives is that it seems like an idealistic 50s, you know, sitcom neighborhood. And that's because it actually is. Ricky Butler's house was the Munster's house. Tom Hanks' house was the Leave it to Beaver house. So Ricky Butler makes crude comments to Lieutenant Rumsfield's wife right in front of him. Why? Ricky Butler don't give a fuck. Hey, uh, Mrs. Rumsfield. No tan lines this morning. Looks nice. That kid next door is a meatball. He also laughs at the neighbor and kind of sets up situations and just kind of lights the fuse and lets things happen. That's Ricky Butler's thing. He lights the fuse, steps back, watches everything happen. He doesn't just watch it, he invites everyone to come watch it with him. So, I mean, it's pretty obvious who's running things, right? Ricky Butler. Now, there's a lot of things to kind of support this. There's a scene that was in the work print, which is on the new Scream Factory Blu-ray. And whenever they're going into Walter's house in the actual movie, Rumsfeld comes out and he's sort of like, taken a window pane out and snuck in like a soldier but in the work print Corey Feldman actually manipulates Rumsfeld into breaking this window it's beautiful why don't you break a window don't break the window how did you tell him to do that because I figured he would classic classic Ricky He's also really excited about finding this bloodbath. Yeah, well, if it was a head wound, forget about it. This seems good like hell. It would have been over in a matter of minutes. I think I should go upstairs and check this out. I mean, like, maybe the guy's, like, upstairs in a bathtub or something. Cracked his head open. There's, like, blood and stuff everywhere. Just don't touch anything up there, all right? Yes, sir. Mr. Peterson. Obviously, Ricky Butler is metal as Fuck. So Ricky's parents, they're not gonna be home until Thursday. He has this girl come over to watch the show. So what about your parents? Well, they're not gonna be home until Thursday. Gail, I swear to God, this is better than anything on television. Why can't we go to a movie? A movie? That's not real. It's the same as television. Trust me, this is real. This is my neighborhood. So first he invites his girlfriend and then he invites everyone. Now there's another scene where Ricky Butler gets Art to climb a ladder to jump the Klopex fence and get in their backyard to snoop around. Now Art falls off the ladder and is totally winded. And what does Ricky Butler do? Does he help? No. He does this. <laughs> He threw a goddamn pickaxe at him. Like, he could have severely injured him. And in fact, in real life, he definitely would have had his wig split open and possibly bled to death. Ricky fucking Butler, man. He doesn't give a shit. He's setting all of this up just to entertain himself and his guests. Because that's how much Ricky Butler cares about putting on the ultimate party. Now, Ricky calls everybody about this party pretty early on. Yo, Steve, man. Hey, what's the haps, dude? You gotta come down here today. It's gonna be live. I thought you got to. Well, it, something's about to happen. I can't tell you. And I mean, it's incredible. Like, if you look at the end of the movie, at this crime scene, what, they're in a cul-de-sac where there may be, I think, six houses on this cul-de-sac. And look how many people are there. That's how many people were at Ricky Butler's party. It is insane. I mean, there's a scene where Ricky even dives onto a police car to try to stop him. Now, I'm not gonna say that he would have been shot for sure, but he, he would have been shot. So now Ricky Butler's party guests start to show up and we meet Steve Kuntz. 
Now Steve is played by Nikki Katz, who you may recognize from Dazed and Confused. Hey, Mr. Rumsfield! <laughs> hey, yo, man. I wanted to introduce you to my friend. This is Steve Kuntz. Hey, dude. Huh? Teach her to watch the show this afternoon. Great. So he's there to watch the show this afternoon. And one thing, he keeps telling Rumsfield, like, you know, can we get hurry? Because... I gotta be to work in just a little bit. Ow! Hey man, when's the big unveiling, huh? Look, I gotta go to work in a couple hours, you know. Hey man, piss off. Ricky, Yo. get this lame -o out of your yard. Get out of my yard, lame -o. Hey, <laughs> hey, get out of my yard. Although, if you watch the movie, the end of the night, Steve Coons is still there. So he had to go to work, never went to work. You know why? Because Ricky Butler's party was so epic that this guy just quit his fucking job to stay. Was it the right decision? Absolutely. And you'll see why. I mean, the whole thing culminates in a house blowing up. Obviously, that's a party worth quitting your damn job over. One of the great party moments here is when he yells at Rumsfeld on the roof. Yo, Rumsfield! Steve Koontz just drops this fucking food that he's holding to applause. Everyone's excited. Like, it's starting. At this point, Steve Koontz has decided beyond shadow of a doubt that he is not going to work because this is not to be missed. And also, just when everybody's, you know, getting bored and hungry, they're gonna go to McDee's. Ricky Butler saves the fucking day. Listen, man, we're, we're gonna make a run to McDee's. You want a quarter pounder or something? Oh, no way! Hey, wait, you guys can't go now. It's the best part. I called the pizza dude. All right. Called the pizza dude. Turns out, the pizza dude saves the fucking day. Oh, pizza dude! <laughs> totally saves the day. So how does this modern epic end, you ask? How else? With a wink and a smile from Ricky Butler. God, I love this street. Ricky Butler is a hero. In fact, at the end, Ray, Tom Hanks, puts him in charge of the neighborhood. I wish you to keep an eye on the neighborhood for me. You betcha, Mr. Peterson. No problem. And the partying didn't stop in front of the camera. It wasn't restricted to that. It extended to behind the scenes. Now, there are several reports from different people involved with the film that Corey Feldman was partying pretty hard. He was uh, kind of lost in looking, I think, during that time. There was there was a lot going on on that set, you know, that Joe <clears throat> seemed to never know what he was going to deal with with Corey. You know, he had some interesting guests, friends that came to the set. Porn stars. There's also an incredible urban legend stories that Joe Dante and different people have told about Corey Feldman and Michael Jackson's pet monkey, Bubbles. But Corey Feldman addressed this in this interview with Yahoo. Is this, is this true? Can <laughs> no, we... this is Joe Dante's special. It's... This is a Joe Dante special? Yes. So you know what the rumor is, yeah, that you that had, I, that I had Bubbles, bubbles in the... Michael Jackson's pet yeah. monkey visit you on set. he was throwing feces you... around everywhere or yes. something like that. It, over your trailer, I think, is how yeah, the story goes. No. This is this is false. No. There, the guy who played my neighbor, okay, 
Now, I don't know if you'll remember this, but I had, okay, so it was me and my gang of friends that I was, like, introducing everybody to and having them come over to, like, watch the neighborhood like it was a show. And that was kind of the whole basis and premise of my character and my involvement with the street. So the guy that first comes over, he's got this, like, big bouffant kind of crazy hairdo. And he looks like, you know, an 80s Hesher rock kid. This kid, in real life, his name was Nick. He had a pet spider monkey. And I was like, oh my God, I love monkeys. I would love to have my own monkey. I want a monkey. And he was like, dude, I'm going to be honest with you. They're a pain in the ass. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? It's a monkey. They're adorable. He's like, yes, it's adorable, but they fly all over your house. They pull your hair. They break everything. They defecate all everything. over the place. They defecate and throw it on the wall. Yeah. You know, he's telling me about all this stuff. And I'm like, oh man, maybe I don't want a monkey. So... To prove it to me, he brought the monkey down to the set a few times. Yeah. So I'm thinking Joe is mixing up the fact that, you know, this kid who was one of the actors in the movie had a pet spider monkey that he brought down to the set a few times. And I think in Joe's mind, because he knew I was so kind of fascinated with Michael yeah. during Gremlins and then later became friends with Michael during Goonies. And, you know, and then it was like, OK, a couple years later. So he probably thought it was Michael's monkey, maybe. He also claims that all he was doing on set at the time was smoking weed and people could smell the weed outside of his trailer so they became concerned. But he says that at some point during the filming, Joe Dante and Carrie Fisher actually took him aside and gave him an intervention about how he needed to, you know, knock off the drugs because they were going to take him over the edge. That's right. Also, Carrie Fisher is in this. Princess fucking Leia is married to Forrest Gump in this movie. That's right. So let's talk about Lieutenant Rumsfeld for a minute. He's a soldier who cannot wait to break out his toys and engage in some espionage. I'm talking like infrared scopes, weapons, animal crackers. And not those like shitty animal crackers. I'm talking the soft Barnum's animal crackers that come in the little box with string on it. Now, this is something that most people probably won't catch, but it's one of the funniest things about the movie to me. It's like a tiny detail. Rumsfeld is a lieutenant. They refer to him as a lieutenant. Now, a lieutenant is the lowest rank for an officer that you can be in the military. From his behavior in the movie, you would think, oh, you know, he retired, he spent an entire career in the military, but no. I mean, if he got out as a lieutenant, then that means he only could have spent like four or five years in there. There are lots of things he does, like when he breaks into Walter's house, he has this thing where he says, How did you get in there? A soldier's way. Saves the day. He talks about Southeast Asia, which I guess could be Vietnam or Korea. In Southeast Asia, we call this type of thing bad karma. And at one point, when he's gonna snap one of the Klopek's neck, he says that he was 18 months in the bush. <laughs> Don't you make a move, Sonny. I was 18 months in the bush and I could snap your neck in a heartbeat. So that's, you know, if he's telling the truth, that's a year and a half of frontline combat, supposedly. Although traditionally officers aren't on the front lines of combat. I mean, in Vietnam, I, I, I'm not going to say never, but... Officers are sort of like the managers and the supervisors, you know. They're not out there doing the work. They're watching and telling other people to do the work. But, you know, either way, that's just something that I think is really funny about the movie that I never hear anyone mention. But if you look at other little things, like at the beginning, he raises his flag in the morning. But instead of, you know, he doesn't have the, the rope to raise the flag, he's got a push button flag raiser. So it's all about convenience with him, which, I mean, is that really a soldier's way? And towards the end, when they're going to break into the house, he has 
this uh, radio and he's talking about how he can raise the power company and the police channels on that. You know I can raise all the police channels and the power company channels on this baby? Although he doesn't and as the police show up at the end he didn't know because he wasn't even listening. It's another one of those things. He has all these toys that he just has but has no intention of using. It's like how I buy Magic the Gathering cards, but I don't play Magic the Gathering. I just have the cards. And it's sort of the same thing. Or not. So there's just all of this like pointless preparation that he has. So at the beginning when we meet Tom Hanks, we see that he's on vacation and as Carrie Fisher puts it, he's in rough shape. One of the deleted plot points of the movie was that Tom Hanks wasn't actually on vacation. He had actually been fired from his job and he was afraid to tell his wife. So he was on vacation. There's actually a line early on that sort of supports this. Look at you, you're gonna sit around the house all week doing nothing, get bored out of your mind and go back to work in worse shape than you are now. No, I'm not. See? No, I won't, because he's not going to go back. There were some scenes that sort of featured his boss, and I don't think that they even like went too deep into it, but it, it was something that was there. And even though they cut that scene out, it was something that was woven into the story and just the general idea. Even though they don't talk about it, I still think that that holds weight as part of the story. It reminds me of this Ernest Hemingway idea, where he talked about writing as being an iceberg and 90% of what the story is is buried underneath the water. Things that you're never going to know. Personal things about the character that you need to know as a writer to be able to write the character. But that doesn't mean that all those things are going to make it into the story. His birthday, his you know biography, things like that. But you need to know it because you have to know the character. So only 10% of the glacier is showing and that's the actual story. So if you think about that, then, you know, him being fired is part of the story. It's just the 90% of the iceberg that's buried. And you know, it's still kind of alluded to in the movie. So there's some semblance of it there. Now at the beginning, Carrie Fisher has a line. Well. I think it's time that we all stopped acting like kindergartners. Don't you, Ray? Yes, Carol. Oh. Now, before somebody falls off a roof or sets themselves on fire, I think we should go over there, knock on their door, and invite ourselves in for a nice neighborly chat. And it's really hilarious, because by the end of the movie, both of these things have happened. And I mean, the whole movie takes place in less than a week. So in about two or three days, they go totally off the rails and blow a fucking house up. Now, there were several deleted endings to the movie. It became clear that you couldn't make this movie and kill off Tom Hanks because he's the star. He's got to live. There was another deleted ending idea that I've read about before where the Klopex weren't murderers at the end. They, they were innocent. So... Basically, Tom Hanks and the other neighbors broke in, blew the house up for no reason. But, you know, Tom Hanks is in it. You have to have a happy ending. The Klopeks try to murder Ray, and they confess to him that they actually killed the people who owned the house that they live in. Tom Hanks gets them after the pizza dude saves the fucking day. Tom Hanks gets them with a citizen's arrest, and they save the day. I mean, Geraldo Rivera's coming, you know? Geraldo Rivera's coming. He's going to excavate the basement of the Klopex. It's going to be broadcast on satellite all over the world. Fly! There's this scene where they're going through the garbage, and they throw it out in the street. And this is one of the greatest, like, continuity things in a movie that I've ever noticed. If you pay attention, at the end of the movie, like... From that point on, the trash stays in the street. No one picks it up. And even at the very end of the movie, it's still there. And that's such a beautiful 
continuity touch that most people would have forgotten about. I think the message to uh, psychos, fanatics, murderers, nutcases all over the world is uh, do not mess with suburbanites because, uh, frankly, we're just not going to take it anymore. You know, we're not going to be content to look after our lawns and wax our cars, paint our houses. We're out to get them, Don. We are out to get them. And that's, you know, the thing is that they're out to get the people who don't belong. And by having them actually be bad guys at the end, it changes the whole, like, dichotomy of the situation. Because if they had been innocent and the whole movie is just about how the neighbors, the suburbanites, are the true psychos who just break into the house and blow it up. I Personally, I think that would have been a much more satisfying ending. But, you know can't have Tom Hanks do that. He's a big star. You know, I think three or four years later, he started winning Academy Awards. And, you know, you, you can't kill him. You can't have him be a psychopath. So the movie is, of course, about Ricky Butler throwing the greatest party of all time by manipulating his neighbors into getting more and more paranoid and crazy about this until they blow the house up. But it's also about how the suburbanites are psychos who can't stand anyone different than them in their little bubble. You know, the ending that they went with ultimately justified them in their actions, but they still broke into this house and blew it up without any evidence, having not found any dead bodies. And they didn't find out that they were right until afterwards. And in the end, when we finally find out that the Klopeks are indeed guilty, how do we find out? It's because Ricky Butler finds a trunk full of skeletal remains. And look how excited he is about it. I mean, that's metal as fuck. It's, it's just a movie about how Ricky Butler threw the greatest fucking party of all time. In fact, I happen to know someone who has first-hand accounts of Ricky Butler's epic party. So let's see what he has to say. Yeah, man, you know, my whole life, I spent my whole entire life hearing about this party. You know, nothing nothing ever compared to that for him. I mean, no matter how, how hard I tried at soccer, at playing the guitar, nothing I could do ever would lend to, to him, giving him anything else to hold on to other than that party at Ricky's house. And I mean, understandably, because that was the greatest party of all time. And I'll tell you why. Parties have a tendency to stop right as they're picking up. You know, they're just, somebody's gotta go to work, somebody's gotta go do this. And if it wasn't for my, you know, people see, people wanna say that Ricky threw the greatest party of all time, when in reality, my father saved that party. If my father had gone to work, nobody would've come to that party. Nobody liked Ricky. Every day of my life, I've heard about this party at Ricky's house. And I mean, explosions, I mean, I mean, pe dead bodies. I mean, have you ever been to a party like that? I haven't. I've been waiting my whole life to go to a party that good. Uh, a lot of people don't talk about the fact that my dad just never went to work. I mean, he said he had to go. And uh, he didn't, you know, next thing you know, he's still just there. He quit his job. Have you ever quit your job for a party? I wouldn't do that. I got a good job. Yeah. So have you ever, have you ever uh, met Ricky through the years or... Is he still around, or, um... Ricky, no, Ricky's in prison. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Is it, I mean, from what I a... understand. So you've never met Ricky? I mean, I've, I've never met Ricky, but I'd like to. Um, uh, I think, I think, all, I think everyone would like to meet Ricky. I think everyone would like to be Ricky. I mean, just think about the implications of throwing the greatest party of all time. It sounds trivial. It really does, to the, to the un... Uh, to the uninitiated, it sounds like, okay, he threw this awesome party. But do you really consider that? I mean, what is life if not a series of great parties? And if you throw the essential greatest party of all time, I mean, he, he has the greatest life ever. I mean, even though he's in prison now. But, you know, still, I mean, he owns that moment forever. That was his. He did that. And... uh I'd like to, I'd like to, not only would I like to meet him, I'd like to be Ricky one day. I'd like to throw the greatest party of my life. I mean, I don't know if I could touch Ricky's party, but I could at least have my own greatest party ever. You know, most kids spend their life, you know, doing things with their dad, like fishing, working on old cars, you know, something to that effect. But me and my dad would just sit around talking about this party every day. 
every day we would talk about it. And I mean, you know, he would say the things to me, why can't you be more like Ricky? Why don't you ever throw parties? And uh, I never could give him a good answer, I guess, but would have loved to, you know. So I love the Burbs. Anyone that I know that has seen the Burbs, they love it. I, I don't know anybody who's seen it that doesn't like it. I mean, I'm sure there are people who don't like it, but, you know, I give this movie a fucking 9 out of 10. And I think that if you haven't seen it, you should go find it and watch it as soon as possible because you won't be sorry. So, I don't know, what do you guys think? Do you think that the movie is about Ricky Butler throwing the greatest party of all time? I mean, the more that I watch it, like, at first I, I watched it and I was like, holy shit, this movie is really about this kid throwing this epic party. And the more that I've watched it with that in mind, the more weight that it holds. But I mean, what do you guys think? Do you think that that's a solid sort of argument about what the, what the movie is? Or do you think that that makes no sense? Let me know in the comments. All right, guys. Well, as always, thanks so much for watching. I appreciate every single one of you taking the time to sit through these videos. It means so much. If you want to see more videos like this, make sure you go down and subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you next time.